Hi everyone, Mary here, and I wanted just to welcome you to our physics class. Um, this is the first video for the entire course, and in this video we are going to talk a little bit about what is physics and describe the scientific method, which I know you've studied before, but let's get it to the front of your brain. So here goes. As we begin this course, um, as you watch these videos, I'm going to encourage you to do a couple things. First off, please take some notes. The more of your senses that you can get involved in your learning, the better you're going to learn something. So if you take the time to actually write notes down in a notebook, one, you're going to have them handy so that you can look at them later, but two, the act of actually writing, it puts it through your eyes and your, your hands and your mind one more time, it is really going to be a wonderful tool to help you learn this information. Number two, if things in the videos are going a little fast, please hit pause. I, I know you know how to work YouTube. Um, you're a modern adult person. You know how to do this. And so hit pause if you need to. I am going to go through the notes and go through the course at a talking speed, which is faster than writing speed. And so therefore, you're going to have to hit pause once in a while to write down some definition. You've got to be your own best friend and do that if you need to. If I get waffling on to something and I'm talking a little bit slow, well then listen at a faster speed. You can do that. You must be your own best friend. And if you can be your own best friend by adjusting speed for you, then you're going to go through the course in a pace that is more tailored to your needs. Periodically, we're going to do some practice problems. And when we do those, very often I'm going to say hit pause and try this and then hit play again and we'll go through the solution. Please try those. Please do those. The analogy I like to make is playing the piano. You can listen to someone play the piano all day long, but that does not necessarily mean at the end of the day you're going to know how to play the piano. Um, you have to actually get your hands on a piano and practice lots and lots before you are good at it. Same thing happens with learning how to do physics problems. You've got to do them for yourself. So let's begin with a definition of physics. Um, physics is defined as the stutter study of matter and energy and its interactions between matter and energy and back and forth. Um, physics actually involves forces, and motion. What puts an object in motion? What stops an object from moving? There are lots and lots of different topics that we go through in physics. Um, depending upon which class you're taking and how in-depth that class is going to be, depends on how much of these we're going to do. But we're going to talk about straight line motion and projectiles, sometimes magnetism, uh, nuclear reactions, light, electricity, uh, nuclear power and exactly how does that occur and where does that come from. Different kinds of waves, sound waves and uh, like this beautiful sonic boom and light waves. Gravity, there are gravitational waves too, pretty cool stuff. We're going to analyze motion and sometimes in some courses we're going to talk a little bit about heat. But all of these are topics and ideas that are under the big umbrella that is physics. Let's talk a little bit about the scientific method. Now, I know you've studied it a dozen times through your many years of going to school, but I want you to under understand there was a time before there really was a scientific method. In those days, people used logic and what they thought was common sense, and they just believed things were true, so they must have been true. Here's a couple of examples of where that was done. For many, many, many years, it was assumed that the Earth is the unmoving center of the universe and that the sun orbits around the Earth. Well, it wasn't until Galileo looked up into the sky with his telescope and he actually saw phases of the planet Venus that he was convinced that we actually do orbit the sun, that it goes the other way. Back many, many hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, um, there was this crazy belief that a knife could be used to cut pain. And so if someone you loved was 
in pain, they would very often put a knife underneath the bed to help cut the pain. Now, you and I both know that that's just goofy, and putting a knife under somebody's bed is not going to do them any good, and they're going to probably think you're a little wacky. Um, thousands of years ago, it, this was actually written in old Greek medical texts from about 2,000 years ago, it was taught that men have more teeth than women. And the reason it was taught that men have more teeth than women is common sense. They thought it was common sense. They thought men have a tendency to be a little bit larger of structure. Men tend to have a little bit larger jaw. And so, of course, men have more teeth than women. Well, if you've ever taken any anatomy and physiology, you know that a adult human has exactly the same number of teeth. It doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman. It was just taught and written in medical textbooks long ago and far away because nobody did anything as simple as count teeth. So back in the 1600s, there was the beginnings of what today we refer to as the scientific method. Uh, Galileo Galilei, he, one of the big luminaries in physics, was a scientist who actually worked in Italy at that point in time. And many people consider him the father of the scientific method, and if not the father of the scientific method, one of the people who employed it in the very beginning and did some amazing early science with it. I know you've discussed parts of the scientific method in your other classes, so let's just review this. A scientific method, typically there's an observation. You make an educated guess, which is a hypothesis. You do some sort of an experiment to determine if your hypothesis is correct, and then you draw a conclusion. So let's go through a real simple example of the scientific method. Let's say that you come upon this person over here, and this person has a red nose and kind of red eyes and is covered over with a blanket. And you go, oh my gosh, I think this person is sick. Um, he or she looks like she's got some sort of a cold of some sort. Now that is an, ed then you make a hypothesis, which is your educated guess. And it's based on your observation and your past experience, your knowledge, what you have learned up to that point in time. Now, how do you test a hypothesis with some sort of an experiment? Now, the experiment usually involves gathering some sort of data. So what kind of data can you gather for this poor little soul right here? It might be a temperature. You use a thermometer. Um, you might just talk to them and ask them how, how long they've been feeling this way or what are their symptoms. All of these are pieces of information that help test your hypothesis. Were you correct? When you gather data in science, data comes in two forms. One form is called qualitative data. The other form is called quantitative data. Now, these are two words that I would expect an educated scientific person to know. How do you keep them straight? Qualitative, quantitative. Quantitative is data that involves numbers, and buried inside of the word quantitative is that word quantity. It involves some sort of numbers. Qualitative data is non-numerical data. So you might look at this fellow and you might say, oh my gosh, he looks very, very pale. I bet he does not feel well. Now, which one is that, qualitative or quantitative? Yeah, that's qualitative data because of the fact that it doesn't involve numbers. Now, you might take blood pressure or pulse or something else that could give you quantitative data, numbers that will help determine if your hypothesis was correct or not. Let's see if you've got this concept of qualitative or quantitative down pat. So hit pause, and what I want you to do is determine if these are qualitative or quantitative. All right, are you back now? Let's take a look. My cat, and this is really my cat, her name is Maudie. Yep, that's her. Um, my cat weighs 10 pounds. Is that qualitative or quantitative? That is quantitative, because it involves a number. She's black and brown. 
cool. Oh, I, did I point in the wrong direction? I pointed in the wrong direction. My cat weighs 10 pounds. That's quantitative. That involves a number. Now, she is black and brown. Qualitative. That just describes the cat. She has four little kitty cat feet. That's a number. Numbers are quantitative, and she likes tuna. Tuna, that's qualitative. It's a piece of really important unit information. It just does not involve a number. At the end of the scientific method, you draw a conclusion. And a conclusion is a judgment based upon observations and data. Now, are experimental conclusions ever wrong? Of course they are. Yes, they are. That's why scientists repeat and repeat and repeat experiments over and over and over again. Now, originally, we saw it, thought this person was sick. What are some other possibilities if we happen to be wrong? Maybe this person has allergies. Maybe this person just broke up with their sweetie pie and they're just incredibly, incredibly sad, or they just watched a really, really sad movie. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that could be possible answers to why they look kind of red and puffy. As we do science this semester, or this term, um, science requires that we get in, use measurement, we use data, we use numbers, and we continuously prove that this scientific idea is correct. One of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein is this, no amount of experimentation can prove me right, but a single experiment can prove me wrong. And that is the honest truth in science. Um, lots and lots and lots of experiments are required to make people believe that an idea, a big idea like Einsteinian relativity, is a good idea and it must be true. But all it would take is one truly excellent, repeatable experiment that proves Einstein wrong. And then we're going to have to adjust our scientific theories. All right, that will do it for now, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>